Okay, so hey, before we do that, before we go live, just so you guys know, we are fi we are filming this, and it is going to be broadcast over our, like our YouTube channel, so so people people can come back and watch it. So we'll tell you when it's on, and we'll tell you when it's off. But but uh, it is uh, yeah, we're we're rolling right now. So okay, you want to. Is that the one, Jeff? So guys, uh, thanks very much for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, I know some of you have come a long way to be here. Um, we were looking to have a group of guys that, uh, you know, some guys with robots, some guys without robots. Um, we wanted to keep kind of a, a, you know, create an environment where we can look at networking a little bit, um, you know, bringing in, uh, you know, guys of whether they, whether it's of similar age or similar geographical area and so on and so forth. Um, so we've got guys obviously here from uh, Agassiz here, uh, as well as Harrison Mills, DeRoche, Dudney, um, and then, of course, Abbotsford and, and Chilliwack as well, right? So thanks very much for being here. For those of you that don't know me, Mitch McCormick, I'm a capital sales account manager uh, here at West Coast Robotics. In the back corner, that is Jason Jordan. He is our newest guy. Um, Jay started in June, I guess, at the end of June, and he's looking after the, uh, the Chilliwack area. I'm, as most of you know, I'm the north. <laughs> Now, can I get you all to stand up, please, for the national anthem? Can I get everybody to rise and take your hat off? So, so the purpose of, of, of this event is to give you guys a little bit of insight into sort of the A3, the A4, and the A5. So there are guys in this room with A5s, there are guys in this room um, who have had A3s, there are guys in this room with A4s, and there are guys who um, have never uh, milked robotically before. So um, the purpose of this uh, event is to give you guys a little bit of insight into the differences between the three robots, everything from how it operates to, um, to both, both how it operates to the cost of ownership and, and, and all of the above. So um, welcome uh, to West Coast Robotics. This is our, our new logo, um, which you guys might have started to see. You would have seen on the front of our building. When we moved in here, we did a bit of a branding change um, to, a, to a new sort of this. Anytime you go in a marketing situation, when you go from into a rebranding situation, it's always at a time um, when there's big change happening within a company and this with moving into our new building becoming uh, a stronghold here in Agassiz uh, in in what is the old Kent Hotel location I might add um, the uh, however there will be no peelers here this evening I'm sorry to break it to everybody uh, <laughs> so this is our new logo and again thanks everybody for uh, coming so as I mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about A3s A4s and A5s today um, and sort of what are the difference in, in similarities uh, and what is, is new um, with Lely. So one of the biggest things, um, and Brian and I will kind of both talk a little bit about it, and I might ask some questions of some of the guys in the room as well. So in the A4, one of the biggest changes from the A3 uh, to the A4 was the eye flow. So in the, uh, in the A3, we had what was called a K-flow situation. So the cow came in on an angle into the box and then left on an angle as well, but restricting its vision. Um, with this new I-flow situation, we are seeing increased visits to the robot. Would you be able to elaborate on that? Would you agree with that? So Jer Jeremy's farm um, recently converted, they had six A3 necks and recently converted um, to A5s, I guess about eight months ago now, seven months ago. What's your? It's way better for the group, the eye flow, because they all get it going nice, it's really open. But until they learn 
the open pen. That's more of a box. That's more of a box. That's more of a box. Is this yeah. thing on? Yes. That's more of a, a box that they're kind of trapped in, they feel. Mm -hmm. And they just need to learn, and that just took them a little bit longer than. Mm -hmm. And are you for sure seeing increased visits to the robot, like um, from from this change? Yeah, I think so. We went, uh, well, we're not like 3.5 visits or anything, but we never no. were. Ever. Yeah. What about fresh animals? Yeah. To go through, yeah, I think the heifers catch on mm -hmm. a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's cool about this and what's unique to Lely is the fact that this is, we have this patented. So our competitor has a cave flow system and they never won't have a cave flow system because Lely has a patent on the eye flow. So you can see on the far side how the, um, the feed dish kind of just swings in, it drops its grain and then when she's done milking, it, we open back up and away she goes. Is when I first started working for Laylee, we were selling A2 robots, and A2 robots had K flow from the side as well as uh, indexing. And when we went to the A3, we removed the indexing and we just had the K flow, and the box got a little bit bigger. And we, the footprint of the A2 and the A3 were the same, so we would pull an A2 out, put an A3 in, and we would see guys, same ration, same cows, same everything. And they went from 2.7 milkings a day to about three milkings a day. Mm -hmm. Then when we moved from A3s to A4s and we did the same thing in the initial validations, we seen guys go from, you know, three milkings a day to 3.2, 3.4 milkings a day. And now with the A5s, we put a much larger focus on, um, on setting the milk access correctly in order to not over milk the cows because you can really get yourself into a situation where they're just going more and more. So same ration, different box design, and essentially a more comfortable box. Like that's a big part of it. Um, I think that's a big reason why we believe in free flow so much is because we don't really have a hard time getting the cows to go to the machine mm -hmm. um, itself. So. So as far as uh, milk prep and milk harvest, um, I'm going to get Brian to talk. Brian's going to talk a little bit more about this, but um, there was a change from the A3 to the A4, um, but from the A4 to the A5, it was the same, um, same T prep, same pulsation and same takeoff. A um, little bit about the changes from three to four. Yeah, from the A3 to the A4, all they really did was tighten up some things down in the uh, arm. Um, and they did that in order to move the, the flow sensors from the top of the jar to in the arm. Um, you, no, your robots. The original A3s had the, um, had the milk flow sensors on the jar. And so when we attached the teat cup to the side of the teat or folded the teat over, it took about 27 seconds for the milk flow to reach those sensors. So the, the logic there is you know, if I don't see flow in the amount of time she normally takes plus 10%, it must be wrong. So then we would disconnect and hook back up. And by moving those flow sensors down into the arm, which is the black box you can see there in the corner, we reduce that down from 27 seconds to about eight. Would, would eight be an accurate dead milk time on most cows on average? I think it's eight seconds. So basically when we do, when we do miss an attachment, we can now correct that almost 20 seconds faster than we used to be able to. So when you're comparing Lely robots to other robots, make sure you pay attention to how long that hose is um, to get from one robot, to get from the cup to the sensor, because that's gonna determine how fast you can correct errors. So milk transportation. So originally um, on the A3, we had a pump situation on the A3. When we went to the A4, we went to a milk bladder, and then from the A5 going back to the pump. One of the main reasons behind doing that, why going pump, bladder, pump, was basically because of FFAs. So by using a pump, or sorry, by using a bladder, the idea is that there would be less agitation in the milk um, going from, uh, as opposed to, say, a pumping situation. Um, or sorry, the other way around, sorry. There was too much agitation in the A4, by going back to the pump, there's less agitation uh, and we don't see as much. Uh... No, the idea was the, the centrifugal pump, 
pump spins and can spin the milk, right? Mm -hmm. And basically that churns the milk and creates FFAs. And in Europe, this is a decade ago, they were, they were basically on the same FFA hunt that we are today. And so they went to the bladder in order to reduce, reduce. FFAs yeah. because, it, because it squeezes in. And basically what they realized was that FFAs are much more related to feeding, how often you milk your cows, and um, cooling, how your cooling set up. And so they went back to the centrifugal pump or the centripetal pump because the cost of running a bladder is crazy. Like it's like $100 a month basically of your service costs and they're not exactly the most reliable uh, parts of the A4. I think that everyone here can agree with that. So would, you, one. would you agree with, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah. There, there you go. <laughs> no, you haven't had too many problems? Rupture the bladder. No. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that after. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so vacuum pump, uh, same vacuum pump on both robots. Brad, you want to touch on that one? Yeah, so not much change there. So wash system. Yeah, so the wash system basically is a one-shot wash. So if you have a milk parlor today, you're used to filling a sink and you cycle the water around. In a robot, what we do actually is we run the wash through the line. We run, we rinse with cold water. We run hot water with acid in it, one wash. And then we run cold water again. And then on the next wash, well, the next two, we do it with detergent, so we don't actually cycle the water around. Um, costs a little bit more in electricity to do it that way, but you use substantially less chemical because you're just using much hotter water. Um, and that's essentially how I believe most robotic milking machines work that way, with the exception of one. Um, that it's a really common way to wash in, uh, in Europe. On the A3, we had a boiler. And so all of the all of the robots would have to coordinate like two hours ahead of the wash and make sure that that they were all on temperature at the right time. And they went away from that because basically if you had to reset a robot in the middle of that prepping time, it would just create massive problems all over the farm. And on a one or two robot farm, you know, the chances of that happening are low and it's not that big a deal. On a six robot farm, um, it can cause you many sleepless nights. So with the A4 and the A5, basically they're all in sync all the time. You can reset a robot whenever you like and it doesn't affect the, uh, the machine, unless you do it in the middle of the wash. <laughs> I knew Sid was going to say Okay, so Brian kind of alluded to this before. Um, we didn't really show the dimensions on the A3. One of the biggest things, um, or the coolest things, I should say, from the A4 to the A5 and from the A2 to the A3 was the, the, the footprint. So um, with, in the A4 and the A5, the footprint is the same. So we've basically done, um, we've done a couple of different change-outs now at RJR Farms in um, Matt's we we moved we we moved out in A4 moved in in A5 and it was a seamless seamless transition. However, moving the A3 next uh, to an A5 at Marlena Farms was a much more difficult situation. So, a um, couple of challenges that we run into is obviously with each of the A3s they have their own central unit. Um, with the A4 and the A5 we now they come to one central unit can essentially power. Um, two robots. So 
The challenge that we ran into, uh, say, at, at Jeremy's place was, one, the footprint is significantly bigger because it's got more components to it, um, and then which, which then puts the pit out of whack. So, Jeremy, do you want to talk a little bit about what that was like and how, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how challenging that was for you guys? Yeah, we weren't, uh, we weren't aware that it was going to be that, that extensive of, uh, with the floor plan and everything. We had to do four, maybe five pours per room to get it to line up with the, with the A5. So after the first one, then uh, we're like, we've got to do this different. We did it with a manual jackhammer. And we're like, nope, we're getting an excavator in here for sure. So we did that right away, got a guy out, and then you could do it in like an hour jackhammer get it all out and then because you want to get pouring as quick as you can mm. and uh yeah but if it was the same footprint yeah i would do it in a heartbeat yeah then. so when we did when we did the conversion at rjr it was it literally took four hours and it was just a unbolt that slide it out slide the new one back in it was milking cows within about four and a half hours yeah and oddly enough actually we did a change out of some incentec robots in chilliwack uh in 2018 and that actually was easier than changing out a Lely for a Lely. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. I think, too, one of the things Mitch mentioned is that the A5 is quite a bit heavier of a machine. Um, when you kind of, you went from the A2, the A2 was a tank. Like, you think about kind of where Lely was at as a company. The guys are, you know, Lely as a company, when the A2 was invented, would be like a bunch of us sitting in the room and you know we're welding stuff together, and we're we're you know we're going to make it farmer strong. And I seen barns that burnt down, and there was nothing left there except for the stainless steel frame of the A2. Like that, that's how beefy they were. With the A3, they lighten them up a little bit more. You know that's how things go. You use a little more engineering, try to save some manufacturing costs. Um, with the A4, they try to do it again, and ultimately. Uh, Laley has realized that they have gone a little bit too far. We're spending, they're spending, they're spending a fair amount of money going around and updating the frames and putting br braces in. And Laley does pay for all of that, but it's still a big pain in the butt for everybody. And there's downtime involved with that. So with the A5, they've made it quite a bit stronger of a unit um, in order to ensure that it lasts longer. So one of the big things uh, in the A3 and the A4 was the air and electric drive. So we used air compression um, essentially to move the arm, which created a lot of access noise, which made, or excess noise, I should say, which made training fresh cows um, and heifers a lot, more, a lot more challenging. As Sid and Jeremy and Mike would tell you, there's a lot of as the arms move. Um, in the A5, it's an electric drive, so it's a hybrid air cushion. So it still uses a little bit of air, but it's significantly quieter. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. yeah, way quieter. So this is this has helped in a variety of different areas. Um, do you do you guys don't pre-train though? Do you? Yeah, yeah you you do yeah. you do. And are are you seeing a difference? Oh yeah, there's way less effort in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the testing video on the A5, you can check it out on YouTube, um, of the arm. You just type in Laley hybrid arm testing. It's pretty cool just to see how much they beat the crap out of it before they release the robot. It's just a neat thing to see. Um, I'm super impressed with the electric drive. I was super worried about uh, that coming out. We've I've been with Laley a long time, and new products have not always been lovely. And... Uh, this one they really hit the mark on. You know, we 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 got a few cabling issues we deal with that uh, that other, but other than that, we're kind of out of the woodwork, and we haven't had any real failures of of the arm system that drives the arm. So that's uh, been really awesome. So electronic motherboard. This one Brian's going to talk a little bit. Yeah, so basically the A5, um, today, today any option you can buy for an A5, you can put on an A4 or an A3, um, but the A5 Except is... Except the bladder. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, 
the A5 is uh, is the platform though for future updates from Lely. So at some point in time, we will start to see some things that come along that we can add to an A5 that we can't add to an A4 or an A3. Most of that is related to the computing power and speed of the boards. Um, one of the things they've also switched to, which really for the farmer doesn't make any difference, but it's awesome for me, is they went from specific boards for each um, task to they now basically have three standard boards that they share across, um, they share them across the Juno, the Discovery, the Robot and everything. So we basically can stock significantly less parts, which I guess ultimately does make a difference for the farmer because it means that it can be cheaper. Um, and the other big thing that they did, and this is a this is a crazy thing I didn't know, is um, essentially all of the electrical cables are changed out. Actually, that's the next slide, isn't it? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, basically, um, they've opened up all the cable trays. Mice like to hide in cable trays, so they've gotten rid of all those places for mice to hide and chew wires. And... Also, they've now made the wires out of, all wire that you buy in general has fish oil in it. And they discovered that mice and rats like fish oil. And so now every wire that's in the robot that you, on, on an A5 is made without fish oil in the wire. So we're hoping that that deals with the rodent problem because ultimately when we look at service costs there is a fairly large, like when you look at the guys who are really high on the service cost spectrum, a lot of them are really um, fighting a rodent problem. And rodent, rodent chews and wires are the hardest thing to troubleshoot because if it's not chewed all the way through, it sort of works sometimes and it sort of doesn't work other times. And wiring issues are, you know, well, if you've ever worked on your tractors, it's uh, wiring issues are difficult to uh, solve. So... So and we have some we have some uh, organic dairies where this is obviously an even bigger problem than you would imagine because they're not using any kind of uh, rodent pesticide or anything like that. Right? Um, so yeah, so moving along. So first time attached. So we believe we had the best uh, on the market until the A5 came out. Um, so first time attached, it was good before. Um, we believe it's even better now, Brian. Yeah, and and basically part of that is is that the the uh, the laser in the new robot and the processing speed of the boards can communicate all that information back and forth much quicker. So the arm reacts quite a bit faster. It's really able to follow the cow quite a bit better when it's attaching. Um, also, uh, the laser is now actually more. The laser is used more for arm positioning than it used to be. So once it's under the cow and it's got the teats, it kind of switches from using the camera at all to really using the, the laser to guide where it is. Um, and probably the biggest thing is, is that on the A5, you can basically, you can put the cow in, you can hit start, it will go in, find its spot, and it will find the teats. And you can then walk around to the other side of the robot, calm the cow, and basically turn some of those two man jobs back into one man jobs. So I will say this, it's first time attach. Um, lots of sales guys are gonna come around your yard and talk about wonderful, perfect first time attaches that go perfectly well 99% of the time. Cows are still cows. If that heifer's not standing still, it is not going to go perfectly well 99% of the time. If she's freaking out, jumping around and kicking, it is what it is, right? So um, just be aware of that as a, you know. And the A5 also has, like I say, with the ability to, to pre-train, um, with it being quieter, with the electronic arm, has a little more fluid movement than, say, the air, com air compression. So there's been, there's a number of the things that we've already talked about have led to better first-time attach as well. But obviously a one-button push is is uh, makes a significant impact. I think a big thing too with first time attach is we do really believe that lead lead training heifers makes a big difference in how easy it is mm -hmm. to do the attachment the first time. So if you allow your your close up heifers like say at 4 weeks away from calving, bring them into the sort pen, 
let them go through the robot, get a kilo of grain, the arm moves beside them, get, um, you know, gets them used to all the noises, they know where the grain is. Then basically you do that for a week, you move them into the close-up pen. Then when you bring them in the first time, they're used to it. It's a much calmer experience and it does really help with the frustrations that can be involved in first time attach. Yeah, so connection time. So we've just got a little comparison across the board here. Um, average time to successfully attach a cow on the A3, we had 36 seconds. Uh, on the A4, we went down to 35. And then on the A5, uh, we went down to 30. Um, average attempts to successfully attach each teeth, that's 1.34, 1.39. Obviously, you guys can see that. Um, now, the one thing that this kind of isn't taking into account is that Obviously, there's more data on the A3 because the lives of those robots has been significantly longer, right? So on the A4 and the A5. So we've seen traditionally that those numbers on the A4 and the A5 will actually improve over the life of the warranty and over, you know, number of milkings and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. and I think another thing that plays a big role in that is anyone who has an A3 has had, most people who have A3s have had robots for a long time. And when you have robots for a long time, you, you start to call some of your cows because they aren't exactly ideal for your robot system. So one of the things you got to remember is the guys with the A3s probably have the best robot cows compared to the guys with the A5s because they haven't gone through that 10 years of dealing with, yeah, you know what, she's not that good and I don't have any other cows to call, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to get rid of her, right? So... You know, really, the fact that the A5 is that much better than the A3, you know, that says a fair amount because the guys with the A5s, they're just getting into robots, whereas the other guys have been dealing with this um, for a long time and probably have gotten rid of some mothers so that they don't have some daughters that they might not want to have, right? So, so teat dipping, uh, obviously, we... Um, we believe we had a, a good system, a working system on the A3 and in the A4. Um, it's significantly, <laughs> Sid shaking his head. Good, good word choice. Yeah, adequate. adequate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so on the A5, we believe it's 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 near perfect today. So one of the big changes is in on the A4. Once milking was complete, um, it didn't it didn't rescan. So it just operated on memory from where the teat was from the original scan prior to attachment. On the A5, rescans the teat after uh, after milking in order to make sure that that teat hasn't, you know, once that bag is empty and things sag up a little bit, that those teats might not be in the same place they were before the milking started. So by with rescanning and and better spraying, we're getting better coverage and uh, and better results. Right. Yeah, and I think with that, one of the things is, is on A3s and A4s on a fair number of farms, we actually built a modification that would would do a good job of spraying the teats. Um, it did a wonderful job of spraying the teats, but it also makes your chemical costs um, go up substantially. And I think that that in itself was one of the biggest drivers, I think, for the Vermeers to make the change to the A5 because the teat dip usage dropped by I think almost a third, um, somewhere between a third and half because they had that modification, um, which also you know makes it ca makes the change cash flow significantly better than if you're using the standard settings, right? So, um. okay. So ease of use. So like anything, just like your iPhone or any touch screen, um, any kind of AI, this stuff has just gradually improved. Um, today, it's a little more user-friendly, a little more intuitive, um, and really just um, overall more, much more friendly, um, much more access to different types of data on the robot. Yeah, I, I actually have an interesting question here because this is something I never touch on in my, in my sales process. I never talk about the screen and what the screen shows and how nice the screen is to use. How important ultimately for you guys is that? Like what do you, what do you think? You've had both. One's pretty. Uh, the A3 one is better than one. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Right. And more upfront data, right? Yeah. But is that something like if you were going to talk to Laley about like, hey, focus on this, would you would you make that would you make that a priority or not? The more sensitive it is, the more issues you're going to have with water and dust. I, I think we, I think, like, personally, I think we should have a button on the robot, like a button to put it out of operation and a button to put it in maintenance mode so you can do your maintenance. And we shouldn't have a screen at all. And we should just make the robot two grand cheaper. But you can t attach with your phone, you know what I mean? Only two grand. She's like, there are more than that. <laughs> <laughs> You think you need? Yeah, but they can have an app on their phone too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But. Okay, so we talk a little bit about power consumption on the three. A little bit of an idea about the differences. Um, so everything that we did in our cost analysis as well is based on two robots, right? Um, so have a look at that. You can see what uh, each individual one is, is producing or using in power. Um, obviously, you can see the change from here where the CU is each one of these units has its own CU, whereas from here we now have additional um, costs because we're, uh, however, minimal. Um, because the CU is a, a separate unit. So total cost of ownership. So like I said, we, we looked at this based on, obviously, um, a used A3s, used A4s versus uh, brand new A5. So um, total capital cost for the two. So you're looking at about 125000 a piece. Um, the way that we set up the payment terms was just the how long you would amortize a loan. Um, that obviously is affected by an interest rate, which we factored in. Um, and then there's your total payment on two robots um, over that period of time. Now, obviously, payment terms on used robots are going to be less because they're, the life of those robots is, is going to be less, right? Uh, whereas, you know, we see value in amortizing over 15 years because... Um, we believe the A5 will, that's <coughs> the lifespan of the A5. So electrical consumption cost, that's the one that gives you the idea of, of the, the, different, the, or the different amount of, of power usage. So we just did the math. We multiplied it uh, by the cost of power. Um, and, and those are the numbers that we came up with. So we split those in half to get per individual robot, but that's two, like say, two robot uh, per month cost. So if we come here and we look at uh, average monthly and service and maintenance over the lifetime of the bots. So on the next slide, you guys will see what, 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 we're, what I'm going to show you next. But the idea here is that earlier on in the lifetime of those robots, service costs will probably most likely be less. You're, you have warranty. You have all sorts of other things. Um, and then as, you, as, you, as the time goes on, those service costs begin to climb with more challenges um, with the robots uh, just over time. Um, but that number is, is an average number of what you would pay over the lifetime of the robot. Consumables, we're looking uh, basically on the A3 and the A4, um, right in around 500 bucks a month, um, with the A4 taking a little bit of a, uh, or sorry, the A5, uh, with that number dropping a little bit in teat dip usage, um, no bladders, things like that, right? Yeah, the T-dip usage on the A5 is, um, is, is lower than an A4 with standard settings. But this, these A4 and A3 consumable costs, that is, if you have the T-dip mod, those numbers are probably $100, $125 a month higher than what's on there now. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, when Jeremy and Fred were switching it out, we were, we were using numbers that were 
bigger because they had that modification, right? Mm -hmm. The yeah. other thing to realize in this is the A3s and A4s are used. This is if you're buying them today. Um, and they all go through a full refurb process. So essentially, we find that after they go through the refurb, a used A3 that's, you know, 12 years old, um, it, will, it will operate for the same costs as the A3 did when it was brand new in the first um, couple of years. So we pretty much replace everything but the vacuum pump and the touchscreen and the wires. So, um, yeah, they're pretty much brand new units again when they come out of there. The other thing we do see related to service costs is that there's definitely an uptick at about eight years. Um, so we often talk about putting together some kind of a leasing program or a rental program on robots where, where technically the farmer doesn't ever own them. And if we did that, we would actually come in every eight years, take the robot out, bring it into our shop, refurb it here, because it's cheaper for us to just replace all those parts once than it is for us to come with a call out fee and a and an hourly rate every single time. So there's definitely an uptick in service costs at about the eight year mark. Um, year nine's cheaper again, but eight years is definitely the most expensive year. Yeah, and then so the last last column is just basically um, what your total monthly payment is on, on two robots, um, just to give you an idea of, of what that number is. Obviously amortized over a significantly different period of time, so. Um, and part of the reason we amortize the A3 robots over nine years is because um, part support for the A3 yeah. will be over in 2028. We've already committed to some people that we will make sure that we service them out till 2030. And so that's why we put nine years on that for amortization because in 2030, you're gonna have to change them out. Okay, so last slide, this is just a little look inside uh, West Coast. So one of the big things that, uh, that we talk about all the time, and for those of you that have the time this evening, um, we're gonna get into a little bit of why Red Robots after if, if everybody, uh, for those um, that would like to stick around for that. But at the end of the day, one of the biggest things for us and for me and for Jason that I see in competitive situations is that there's not, a, we, we are very confident in showing customers what our service costs are and what they will be. And we're comfortable in showing that data. So what this is right here is essentially all our customers with A4s and what their service costs, monthly service costs are. This is all our customers milking with A3s and what their service costs are. So you can see from 347 bucks a month all the way up to uh, 1200 it just really depends on a lot of a lot of different data right a lot of different data points and a lot of different things that you're doing on farm to maintain your robot some guys are doing things on their own other guys are um, you know these all factors in call out fees as well Brian yep. so you know guys that are a little more diligent and going out when the robot calls versus guys that you know just say hey just come fix it so we get a, a wide variation and that is reflected in those numbers as well um, but as you can see on the A5, exactly what we said was, you know, we're right from 309 all the way up to 814, also keeping in mind that we have fewer data points because the A5's only been out milking for two and a half years now. So there's less, there's less time as, as opposed to here uh, or here. Um, so the other big thing is this is, um, to, so 2021 costs per robot. So um, 793 um, on the A3, 731 on the A4, and 547 on the A5. So for a combined, uh, combined, if so, if a farm has multiple robots and they've got an A4 and an A5, or an A3 and an A4, um, and then there's your your total. So these are on non-startup farms, so farms that have been milking for over a year, versus this number right here with A3s and A5s. Um, $629 a month, uh, $128 a month. But those are farms that are, have only, they're considered our startup farms and they're still within the first year of their milking situation. So this is a big thing for us because we claim within the marketplace that we are the cheapest cost of ownership and we are. And we're happy to show you that information if you, as we are doing here today, right now. Um, so that's something that when Brian talks later, 
Um, again, for those that want to stick around for the Y Red Robot presentation, um, you know, we're, we'll show you um, why we feel um, Laylee is, is, is the better robot from a, a cost analysis perspective. Any questions or? I think one comment on this that's important to note as well is our A3 service costs have been dropping substantially over the last number of years. And a big part of that is we've been, we've been, we've, we've, the percent that we've traded in and added and put in new ones and the ones we've brought in from out of province in the last couple of years, we've actually sold a lot of A3 refurbished robots. So they're coming in and now at the end of the day, the age of our average A3 from refurb or new is actually dropping instead of getting older. So our, our A3 service costs have actually been going down, whereas our A4 service costs are, are going up. So that's a little bit why you see that, um, that number so close. Give it another three years and you'll start to, like you'll definitely see that that number starts to grow again on the A3 side because our A3s are actually newer um, in a lot of cases than the A4s. Any questions about that, guys? Cost per milking, like if as like yeah. And he's doing 130 milking a day, and I'm worth pushing 200. Mm -hmm. If I've got the most service cost, I, I can't answer that. You have to come from sales. So yeah. Is there a way that you would run this per milk? We oh, haven't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, we haven't done it per milking, but we're we're very much going to do that because. Essentially, the way I would like to sell robots moving into 2022 is it's this much per day and this much per milking, no capital layout by the customer, no risk on service, no risk on chemical. It's all on us. And basically, then we have to do it per day to cover the capital expenses and the acid and detergent, which is the same whether you milk one milking or 200. But then your inflations, your twin tubes, your liners, your, your teat dip, your um, Astriel, that will all um, be on a per milking basis. So we will have to do the numbers that way in the future. Um, from, from crunching them, um, the biggest difference when you look at it per milking, it's all in the consumables. The robots actually don't, they, like whether you're milking 60 cows a robot or 40, the service costs really aren't that much different. They're certainly not two thirds. Like it, like, you know, they might be a little bit lower, but it's definitely there's definitely not like a solid relationship of if I milk the half the cows, I, it's half as much, right? The other thing we will do too is the goal has always been to switch to milkings based maintenances where we do it based on a number of milkings rather than on a number of days. Um, We've tried that once before. It's more challenging than we thought, and so we're back to doing days, but that's still definitely the goal long-term. Anybody else? So, great machines to get the job done the right way. The Part of the, doing this uh, type of presentation by putting this online and going through all this is because in the world of robotic milking, in British Columbia in particular, we are in a very unique situation today than we've ever been before. And that's that there is a tremendous used market on robots today, right? So whether you are um, milking with A4s and would look at the idea of upgrading to an A5 or whether you um, are milking with an A3 and wanna upgrade or whether whatever your situation looks like, the opportunity today to both get rid of your exist your old robots as well as introduce the A5 or a new milking system into your onto your farm is is greater today and gives the customer far more variety than we've ever been able to offer it. So in years past, it's been you buy the newest robot available because there are no once the A3 the A4 came around, there were no A3s available. Um, now we have a, a much greater range. We have a much greater market for them. And we're seeing guys right from build up guys putting in um, used A3s to small farms. Um, we've got startup. I sold a guy, one of Marlena's 
uh, used A3 Next, uh, who's milks Ayrshire's out in uh, Aldergrove. Um, and we start up probably uh, beginning in November. We're shooting for the second, uh, correct? Right, so November 2nd. So um, that's a farm where dad's ready to be done. He's got a daughter. They milk about 40 cows. Um, and he's looking to make it easier for her so that the farm can keep going, right? Um, and so today, uniquely to um, years past, there's just, there's a market for it all. Um, so this session gives information to guys that have A4s, that would look at A5s, gives information to guys that don't have robots, it gives information to guys that have converted um, or guys that have both like, like Mike, right? So um, it's a really unique time for us because we have a, a unique market um, unlike we've ever had before. And there's value in your robots if for those that are, would be willing and interested in moving or taking a step up to an A5 from an A4, your A4 still has value, and that's what we want you to recognize today, that if you consider your A4 today has a significant amount of value that we can offer. Um, so I, I think that another really fun comment with that is, in the past, sure, in BC, we A3s are our oldest robots. We, didn't, we never had A2s before. But in other parts of the world, you know, you, you, your used robot market has been these A2s, and ultimately the A3 is really the first like entirely commercially viable robot where the farmer can make money, the dealer can make money, and Laylee can make money. At the end of the day with the A2s, it was a highly subsidized situation as far as service costs and things like that from Laylee. So, you know, the A3 really is a good solution. Um, I personally believe it's still the third best robot on the market. And um, I think that people you know, with a refurbed A3, you can be very happy. And even to the point where we now have a customer that actually only needs two robots. And instead of buying new robots, he said, you know what, I'm going to buy three used ones and put them in. And then if it breaks, I don't really have to worry about it. He's, they're really handy themselves. They want to fix it themselves. Well, if you want to fix a robot yourself, you better have capacity because you know, you got to drive to get parts. It's going to take you longer. There's going to be downtime involved with that. And their concept was, you know what, we'll put in three. We only need two. And if one of them breaks, then we can drive to the shop and get the parts or we can respond at 8 a.m. or do whatever. So they're just taking on a bit of a different attitude towards um, how we do robotic milking. So, um, yeah, they're all good machines. They all still currently milk cows and they all... Uh, work for the farmers who have them. So. Any questions, guys, or any comments? So I got Laylee to donate a free cow brush. Every single one of your farms have a name in the draw. Laylee cow brush is worth about uh, 3000 bucks, 3500 bucks after install, and someone's going to get one for free. Rai, you want to draw? Sure. So we try to incentivize guys. We try to incentivize these uh, attendants at these things. Um, we want everybody to come out, have a good time, have some drinks, have some food. Obviously, we talked your ear off for a little bit here. Um, but the winner of the Dreesen Farms. <laughs> Congratulations, Alex. <Robert. laughs> Yeah, the guy in the J and D hoodie. What a fucking yeah, what a bullshit, eh? So yeah, so so free cowbrush will come in and once it arrives, I'll do all the paperwork. We'll get it in for you, and that's a donation by Laylee. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we also recently purchased tickets to the Abbotsford Canucks. So uh, Brad's name isn't going back in there, but we are going to give away some tickets. Um, for attendance here, um, we are going to give away some tickets to the Canucks game. Uh, so we're going to give away four tickets here. So we will draw. Um, we will do two draws here. No, no. Seats, Madari. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Woodside Farms. 
So awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, that, uh, uh, they know I will talk to those guys about uh, when they, when they want to go. Um, you, you don't want them? Well, Jeremy's going to get to go to lots of games. So. <laughs> I'll redraw them. Do you want me to redraw? Bonnie Dune. <laughs> now they will go together. Now I can give them all the same game. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions, guys? Uh, we'll grab some more drinks. For those of you that we have a presentation that we do um, when we're in a competitive situation, particularly with the B Laval robot, um, we would like to do it for those that are interested in, in seeing it. Um, it's something that you would probably only see in our sales process or in our courtship, if you will. Um, but uh, really what it does is it just breaks down the total cost of ownership. Obviously, um, 